And our uh, third case study best practices presentation uh, session uh, will be moderated by Stephanie Foster, who's been the grant coordinator and will continue to be so. Uh, but Stephanie has uh, really brought everyone together for this. I'd like to begin with a round of applause for Stephanie Foster. Thank you. Um, this is so exciting to see so much, um, so many inspiring conversations, and everybody's so excited. And I have the honor to introduce um, our last speakers for the day, um, Ali Solis and Kurt Krieger. And they're going to go, they're, they're swapping order here. So Ali's going to start out, and she's president and CEO of Make Room, which is um, an organization to address the rental housing crisis. We're talking a lot about um, housing development and building housing, but a lot of the rentals are just not affordable either. And uh, Ali saw this as a problem and has started this organization to address that. Uh, so uh, she's got a lot of excitement about this issue. I think you'll, you'll be inspired. Um, and then Kurt has worked for about 30 years in um, in affordable housing and community development, uh, most recently in Portland, Oregon, and uh, he has his own uh, company uh, now. And uh, between the two of them, you're going to be inspired. There's a lot of good information here, so uh, we'll try to stay on schedule. So we'll get started. Great. Give me the axe if I'm uh, taking too long. <laughs> okay. Fantastic. How's everybody doing? It's late in the afternoon. It's a Sunday. Lots of presentations. Thanks for hanging in there with us. Um, as Stephanie said, my name is Ali Solis. I'm with a relatively new organization called Make Room. We are housed in Washington, D.C., but we are operating all across the country. We were created in 2015 because the issue of housing affordability, accessibility, attainability, choose your verb, uh, in this country is getting worse. And uh, as someone that's worked in this field for almost uh, 30 years, we are not seeing this movement in terms of the public and the political will to make this a national priority, at least for me, uh, at a time when um, this issue is getting to urgent proportions, getting the scale and the attention it deserves. So that is why uh, Make Room was created. and. I think, you know, I'm going to talk a little, give some national perspective. We touched on it throughout the day, but I do think it's important. And actually, the real focus of my presentation is going to build on what Esther talked about, and that is real people in this country that are struggling. So uh, again, speaking to this room, I don't think I need to tell you about the extent to which we've got a housing problem in our country. But here's the part that we don't know. And the other reason that make or may not be aware of, the, the other reason that Make Room was um, created was this is a, largely a silent crisis. This is not something, you know, when one of your family members gets cancer, uh, people pull together a GoFundMe page and we talk about it and we mourn and you can go for walks. Um, when families are struggling under significant financial stress because they literally don't know if they're going to be able to make rent, uh, which is often the largest uh, percentage of their income, uh, this is an issue that's hidden, and it's hidden behind closed doors. And there are 25 million people that are suffering all across this country. Uh, the other thing that most people think about is that this is an issue happening in coastal markets. We know about the problems in San Francisco, but you may not know that people in Erie, Pennsylvania, and even in Detroit, are struggling with housing affordability. So we'll talk more about that. But these are the faces, these are the people that these numbers actually represent. Uh, and the one that strikes me the most, maybe the two, because I'm at both ends of the spectrum, as a mother, knowing that there are 8 million children living in households when they're not sure where they're going to put their, if they're going to be able to sleep in their same bed, uh, the average time that um, what we call sort of families that are in and out of homelessness have to move is six times. So imagine being a child having to go to six different schools in one school year. Not just what is the impact on that kid's life, but how about the kid that's sitting next to him that has to wait till Johnny catches up with all the rest of the homework. So I think those are the kinds of stories uh, that we try to talk about. The other kind of misnomer in this country is that this is an issue largely only that people living on public assistance. They don't want to work, they're lazy, they can't work. Uh, and we all know that actually um, of the one in four renters in this country, one in four, uh, they're working at least two jobs. So 78% of this population is working and the rest are largely seniors or disabled. 
And we forget about you know, which kinds of jobs and incomes, uh, or what, what kind of jobs are, are people you know, taking on. And they really are a range, but they make up the fabric of our service working society. So I think that's an important piece to remember as well. Here's the other part that's, that's important. You know, it's not just about the human stories, although that's what drives me every day and reminds me of the work and why I choose this work uh, to do, but it is a significant drive on our national economy as well. So when we talk about, you know, what is the cost as a nation for not addressing the housing challenges, we're talking about $1.4 trillion in lost wages and productivity every year. Every year. Imagine how many jobs could be created right here in Fayetteville and Bennettville if you had uh, more construction, more of the kinds of even smaller scale uh, work that, that John and others are leading uh, around the country and, and in part here. So I think those are an important um, area that we need to remember. The other thing is, you know, as a, as a, as a nation, what is it costing us to not, to not act, right? So when children are growing up in rent-stressed homes, as I talked about, financial stress is the number one the number one public health um, determinant of, of, of long-term public health, right? So uh, kids will suffer not just in the early years, but we have many uh, data points and research that suggests that this is something that carries on for decades into the future. Uh, and Children's Health Watch is a national organization that we've been partnering with. They just put out a fabulous uh, study just last week that really goes through the detailed implications of um, stability and long-term progress and educational issues when families are living and children are living in uh, rent-stressed environments, and particularly those uh, that are in um, env environments that are living in conditions, right, housing conditions that are unfavorable. Uh, I was startled to learn that Arizona is the only the only state in the country that does not require a housing stability uh, sort of requirement for landlords. So not even a basic minimal level of standard. Uh, and so that means, you may not be feeling it now, or you may not be seeing it now, but as the issue continues to grow over the next few years, supply becomes a continual problem, uh, and p the lowest income families, the most vulnerable, are living in a lot of these substandard units. Again, the rippling impacts are profound. So the other issue on the other spectrum is, you know, the millennials, millennial growth in this country. And um, I think I was looking outside. So the largest segment of renter growth, at least in Fayetteville, if that's what the data suggests, was is somewhere between 25 and 35 year olds, right? Uh, and that is something that we're seeing happening all across the country. And they are making different choices. Um, they're, pro, you know, pro, they're um, waiting to start up families for lots of different, uh, different reasons. Obviously, coming out of universities where we sit today with a lot of um, additional debt, right, that they have to take on. And so this notion of what our American dream was and where it's going, particularly for younger people, uh, is something different. And we need to be thinking about that as we're thinking about growth over the next 10, 20, 30 years. And finally, the other end of the spectrum of the most vulnerable uh, populations, as someone who has her 83-year-old father living with her because we really couldn't find an affordable place for my dad, who very much views himself as not needing assisted living. Uh, but this is a real problem. Our seniors are getting older, they're living longer, and um, you know, for those like my mom, who is in a house that's too big for her, she doesn't need to have five bedrooms anymore, and yet the rent is so unaffordable, there's nowhere else for her to go. So how are we thinking about housing options that meet people at the different stages of their lives? Again, the other thing is while, while Make Room is really um, focusing on the missing middle in terms of renters in this country, there's clearly a direct correlation in terms of homeowners. Um, and that's something we want to make sure we don't sort of pit, pit ourselves against, particularly as you're thinking about the future of what a housing plan in this region needs to look like. So about Make Room, we focus not on just, you know, unhiding this, uh, the human suffering that's happening behind closed doors and raising data and analysis in, in simple and creative ways, but we really want to focus on solutions because here's the, here's the good news, right? This is a solvable crisis. Uh, with the political will, with some innovations that are happening already in the built environment, through manufacturing, with the onset of disruptive technologies, we think this is a... a, a actually a readily, easily solvable problem. Uh, the four areas that we focus on are um, identifying solutions that increase the supply of homes that are affordable, identifying and increasing rental assistance gaps, 
Um, and I should note that these aren't just programs. We believe in public-private partnerships. In fact, I just got back from a tour that we're sort of identifying where the private sector is innovating in some creative ways. Uh, and hopefully I'll get a chance to give you some examples about that. The third is an area that's really interesting. And um, for those that might have seen the mayor's State of the Union that came out, where now you have a group of mayors that are really taking on housing, as well as private sector, that part of the news didn't make it out. Um, but Amazon and a few others are partnering with them to look at the issue of homelessness and housing stability, but that we don't have a tool in our federal toolbox uh, to deal with short-term emergency assistance. Uh, I worked for a national organization for almost 20 years, spent a lot of time in Washington. The beauty of Make Room has been that it's allowed me to really get out more. And when you talk to families about what their needs are, they range you know, the spectrum. But not every, but every family needs a long-term rental assistance subsidy like a Section 8 voucher. Many families are struggling, right, but they're getting by, but any little hiccup, uh, a medical expense, a sudden death in the family, means that they go from a relatively stable-ish family to completely unstable, and one missed cycle can really get them on a downward spiral, and um, you'll hear a little bit more about that. So we are a new organization with a different approach, and one of the things that makes us unique is that we have do some creative storytelling and outreach. We identified uh, in 2015 a range of influencers that we really wanted to focus on because we don't have the resources to be kind of a national public campaign like many big brands uh, with millions and millions and millions of dollars do. But we wanted to partner with journalists. Why? Because journalists are the way into how we get our news every day. And uh, in a changing, frankly, journalist and media uh, environment that we're living in, they're also, in some ways, particularly local uh, journalists, the closest connected to the people in their communities. So we wanted to make sure that if they are out there sort of sharing news, that they are, one, connected to good resources that have the latest and most important data that they understand the terms when they report and what they mean uh, so that we can start to change the narrative, that they're connected to real people on the ground so they can get stories that are authentic and meaningful. Um, so I can talk more about that if we have time, but we're doing journalist boot camps to do that kind of an education. And then we have a national story bank. We are wanting to be a resource for policymakers when they need someone to testify in Washington, uh, and they're scrambling for a non-traditional person to share what they're doing. So we have a whole cadre of principles uh, and different, different people that are different pers di bringing different perspectives about why this is important. One of my uh, now closest friends and, and partners on this is a pediatrician out of Boston Medical Center named Megan Sandal. And Megan's been, you know, an emergency room pediatrician for 20 years. And she kept seeing recurring, you know, the same families coming in and out of her system. And she realized that there wasn't enough medicine for her to cure these kids that are having chronic asthma, lead poisoning related issues. Some for sure was uh, related to substandard housing conditions. But nobody wants to live in those kind of conditions. The real issue, there wasn't enough supply of affordable homes in the Boston metro area for these families to move to. I'll give you, so she said, you know what, and it, it, it didn't really hit her because she said, why, why is she coming back with asthma? Why would you get a cat? Your child has chronic asthma. She's been in the hospital six times this month. And she said, we had to buy a cat to eat the mice because the mice were biting the kids. So these are, you know, and these aren't like dramatic, these are real stories that, that she's seeing. So Megan's become a champion around fi fixing the systemic uh, issues and drawing those connections between our public health systems and our housing as a foundation. Uh, and she also, I think, is just, um, you know, become this champion within the pediatric world uh, where, you know, they don't understand our language and we certainly haven't, um, you know, really, really had frequent conversations where we're joining those forces together. So I think figuring out how we get new champions that understand this issue from a different lens is important. The biggest distinction about Make Room than the many other housing organizations that exist in Washington is that we have created a digital platform, and it is a platform that allows and engages everyday people. If you're working two jobs and you're taking care, you're a nursing care assistant or something else, you don't have time to take a sick day, by the way, which you don't get paid for, or vacation time to go sit down with your council member. Uh, or, to, you know, most of the council member meetings are during times that they can't be there. So we're trying to make it easier with um, a lot of great partners 
partners. Uh, we have a digital front-facing tool that you can use from your smartphone. It connects you to other people and resources, uh, and it also is a mechanism that we're using to mobilize uh, real people on the ground to get more civically engaged. We have 200,000 about users. Our goal is to get to 250 this year. We want to have a million uh, renters using our platform before the 2020 elections, and hopefully we'll have time during the Q&A, and I'll come back to that. For a minute, um, I want to just play this story, and hopefully this will work, because we just came from Baton Rouge. This is Carl and Courtney, so, you know, and then I'll talk for a second about the partnerships we're doing with celebrities to engage with them on this cause. We grew up in the same neighborhood, ran into each other again three years ago or so. When I look at her, I, there's a sense of like the neighborhood I grew up in, everything I know, it's Baton Rouge, that's home, that's my family. Having a place for just me and Aubrey as a single mom is not affordable. I couldn't have done it. So I moved in with two other women. So me and Aubrey shared a bedroom for a couple years. And it was a great environment, but right when we were talking about possibly moving in with each other, it kind of happened at just the right time because me and Aubrey were outgrowing that living situation. We knew we wanted to be in this neighborhood. Um, this is where we both grew up. This is where his family is. My mom just turned 74, like that's the thing. I'm kind of the on-call guy, you know? My parents need me to mow the lawn if mom falls, things like that. So it's very imperative that we be close. I got my income taxes done. The amount of money that I was, I thought I was gonna make, I made a little bit more, so my credit that they gave me, the tax credit I got was too much, so I owed up to almost $900. And so, you know, you got that, and then you got $1,200 rent. I ended up being, we were 10 days behind on our rent when I finally paid it, and so that was $50 the first day and then $25 each day. It was an extra $300. So for $1,200 rent, I paid $1,500. Um, we've been on time every other time, but you know, all it takes to start becoming late, you know, consistently is to be late the first time. And now you're behind and you're playing catch up. My daughter has before and after school, and I'm paying $300 a month easy to cover those costs with gas and the traffic to get to and from. It's a lot, you know, costs can get really high really quick. Living paycheck to paycheck, you know, your bills do, but you get paid in like four or five days, so you have to wait until you get paid again. So we usually always have food to eat and we have, you know, her in school and and gas to take her places, you know, but other than that, then it's like, what, we don't have anything left over to just save money. I was in Arkansas, yeah, and my Jeep literally stopped. When you are living paycheck to paycheck and you have X amount of dollars to live on, this is your monthly budget, you know, you throw in an, a, an unforeseen seven, $800 expenditure, whether it's to the IRS, whether it's car problems, whether it's, what if it's a doctor bill? You know, something, I mean, where does that money come from? And the thing is, is when you're stuck at mile marker eight outside of Little Rock, Arkansas, you, there is no grace period. You, you gotta pay what you gotta pay at that moment and you just kinda go, well, when I get to rent, I'll get to rent. And that's, that's a scary feeling. So I'm gonna stop that there because it goes on to have a really fun and cool concert, but I'm mindful of time. The other thing, we, so these documentaries that we did uh, were an intentional way to one, sort of show across the country that this is an issue happening in small towns, small communities, lots of different stories. But then we partnered in our first year with celebrity musicians, uh, and that's what this slide sort of is meant to represent. We found that celebrities, particularly we studied other social causes like hunger in America, and they had built relationships with celebrities that had authentically struggled with that issue. And so we have identified actors and celebrities and are incorporating partnerships with them, uh, frankly, to help build a larger social media following and a base. As I mentioned, we're a big digital platform, but also because we want new faces and new people talking about this issue. Uh, and we have spend millions of dollars on advertising and, and other partnerships that we don't have. So this has been an authentic way to get our message out and to get new people uh, part of our team. The guy that's uh, 
the handsome young guy is a guy is a country music music artist uh, who's up and coming named Kane Brown, and he testified last September before the members of Congress. We brought in Courtney and Carl and 15 other families and did the traditional sort of walking the halls of Congress by sharing their stories. Also did a big media tour, and, and you know celebrities draw attention uh, and bring in new partners. So Rolling Stones become a new partner. We have a two-year-long partnership happening with Univision, where they're going to be doing a series of reporting over the next two years. And it is that kind of constant drumbeat that we're going to need uh, to start to change the way people think about this issue. So I'm, I'm wrapping up here. So these, you know, I'm happy to answer questions during the Q&A part or talk to me after about our digital tool. It's an open platform. We gamified it. We've tested it. And the case study part, I'll get to in a second, um, we, we've, we have focused on how we could use the power of a digital platform along with some of these traditional campaign tools. And one of the things that I think is really important as you, and, and timely as you begin to think about a planning process for the next steps of this is to think about how you're bringing the public along. Certainly the community engagement and those pieces around building the policy that ends the plans are important, but I urge you to think about a broader public forum in, way, in the ways you do that. Uh, we did poll, you know, public in the nine-month period leading up to uh, the creation of a new trust fund in Denver, we worked uh, with the mayor, but mostly bringing outside resources, because the process already had some leaders, like you all in the room, marching down a pathway to figuring out some new tools for addressing housing. What we brought up was expertise in storytelling, documentary. We brought our celebrity talent. We did a polling um, across the city of Denver. We were targeting three council members' districts where they didn't think there was an affordable housing challenge. And we got renters from those places to share their stories. And we had a weekly story reported in different media outlets. Uh, we connected with the university there. We got a lot of younger students involved in the issue. and. We put this all through our digital platform. We learned um, that if you can acquire uh, email addresses of a particular voter type, which we did, um, and it was a test for us because you can get somebody's email and send them information, but ultimately to get them to keep them engaged over a nine-month period means you have to have content that they care about. Uh, we did that and um, fast forward to the time that it came for the city council to take the vote. Uh, we had 60,000 uh, voters, non-traditional voters. I mean, we had council members calling us and saying, how did you get to the doctor out in rural county, you know, who's serving family needs? Uh, to get involved in this campaign. And that's the kind of action that we took. We were able to have, as I mentioned, you know, uh, a lot of other non-traditional partners join this advocacy movement. And um, this now has led to both a regional forum discussion that they're having and a statewide campaign, uh, because the state of Colorado, much like here in Arkansas, looks very different than the progressive city of Denver. And so thinking about how you can use digital tools like this to engage with other regions, smaller cities and towns, around this issue is something I would urge you to think about. So we're looking forward uh, to continuing the discussion. I'm grateful that you brought us uh, here today. And Kurt's going to talk about some of the creative work that he's done through public-private partnerships. And um, I will leave it at that. So thank you very much. Wunderbar. Thank you, everyone, for uh, your forbearance and staying with us this afternoon. I'm glad it's not 65 degrees and sunny outside. <laughs> Uh, and the weather's cooperating to keep folks here. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of the values framework of the work that uh, I think is replicable here in, Arizona, in, in Arkansas um, and try to give you at least three case studies, which I have direct and knowledge of since I was a managing general partner and, and financier of those three projects. Um, someone asked me why I came, and I said, well, because Stephanie asked me to, uh, and she's been a wonderful uh, person to work with, and I want to thank all the faculty for pulling together to make this group a success. I know this is the beginning of a process, not the end of a process. The, uh, the messages that I want to deliver to you today um, really have to do with equity and lay down some values and some principles. Um, smart housing in dumb locations. I see it all the time. Uh, my brother's a custom home builder, and I can draw fire, family fire on this. He's done wonderful things. Nicaragua ecotourism resorts, fabulous. But it's five hours from Managua, and it takes about 12 hours to get there. So um, we have a lot of great designers doing handsome work in inaccessible locations. 
And while it's, it's inviting and it makes wonderful photography, it, you really have to ask whether or not it's adding to the social value of the community. So social inclusion and equity are kind of where I live. And um, looking for those opportunities uh, at the edges, if you will. Um, from my bio, you can see I've been in the academic world. I've been in the private sector about 15 years. I've been in the public sector also about 15 years. So um, to use a ecological example, which Carl uh, raised, is the most productive areas in an ecosystem are at the edges between two biospheres, and those are ecotones. Uh, deer feed in the open land where the grass is the greatest, but they hide in the forest. So that area, the edges between, e between ecosystems, and I would argue the edges between sectors is actually the most productive. The edges between public service and private development, between nonprofit and perhaps um, foundations, and I'll talk about all of those. Um, this has been verbalized a couple of times, so I won't belabor it, but I needed to frame the issue, which is what's it like to be poor in Fayetteville? I only drew from Fayetteville, but I compared, of course, Portland, uh, the area I live and work in most of my time, with Houston and Fayetteville. And actually, it's more expensive to be poor in Fayetteville than it is to be poor in either Houston or in Portland, Oregon. Portland is going through a, a rapid transformation. It's between San Francisco and Seattle, so it's the cheapest house on the block. And people have learned that they can actually telecommute from San Francisco to Portland. So we're getting a lot of advanced technology growth and development in the area. And um, it's having a profound effect, of course. Now, transit is well developed. Neil Goldschmidt, Secretary of Transportation for Jimmy Carter, was a mayor. He was responsible for the fixed rail system that's currently being expanded. And we have streetcars. So we have heavy rail, we have light rail, we have bus rapid transit in planning, and we have streetcar in practice. Uh, pretty much the whole suite of multimodal transportation. So our transportation costs are really low, but our housing costs are really high. The aggregate, however, is only 46% on average compared with Fayetteville's 52%. I didn't look at all of Northwest Arkansas. I think it's higher if you look at the total, uh, total marketplace. So what, does that, what difference does that make? And this is a pie chart which looks at the cost of housing in transit-rich neighborhoods on the left, average American family expenditures on housing, transportation, and other expenses, and then the auto-dependent neighborhood. This is kind of a home run for the business case for the local downtown or merchants that want to be in and around transit-rich neighborhoods, which is people have more disposable income. They can put their kids through college. They can go out to eat maybe once a week. Uh, and you, when you walk places like the west end of Portland or when you walk places like Berkeley, you'll see like five times more restaurants. Well, the reason there's five times more restaurants in Berkeley is they have rent control. People are only paying a small portion of their income on rent, and it supports a lot of small businesses. So the connectivity, and I'm not here to sell rent control in Arkansas, I'm smarter than to try to work against type, but the point is, is that there's a business benefit to affordable housing, and that business benefit is locally shared, as John mentioned, the local donut shops, the local baristas, uh, all benefit from that. You're not shipping your money to Exxon or Shell or J.P. Morgan Chase or Bank of America, where I keep my mortgage. <clears throat> Context is important. Uh, this is a project that's in Capitol Hill of Seattle. It's a historic home wrapped by equitable housing. The home itself is actually the community space for the overall project. But the values that I wanted to mention, the principles of economic development are there. Uh, vitality, inclusion, accessibility, and sustainability. Those all have to work in concert together. And I'll give you some examples of how I think that works best. Well, I decided not to do a deep dive into Portland because Portland is such a unicorn that it's hard to transfer what happens in Portland to elsewhere in the country. To give you a couple of good examples, uh, the housing budget for affordable housing is bigger than the police budget. And that's because housing is the top priority of the city council and of the mayor. So um, when it came time to do budget development, Every department was asked to make 5% budget cuts, except for housing. And all that money went back into housing. Uh, voters have approved a $258 million property tax levy. We tax short-term rentals as if they are hotels. We use that money for affordable housing. 
Uh, 45 percent of the tax increment financing goes into housing. So there's 215 million dollars a year that goes into affordable housing finance and development, and it produces a lot of really handsome work by a lot of really capable firms and a lot of nonprofits and some for-profits. But one thing I did want to mention is that in even places like Portland, we run the risk of what I call eco-apartheid, and this is a quote which I'll leave for you to read for yourself, but people are clever enough now to come to community meetings to oppose projects on environmental grounds, even though it's kind of green-wrapped bigotry. And I think it's worth calling it out for what it is and to recognize that the entire city has an obligation to elevate uh, affordable housing opportunities. Obviously, transit centers, the central city are important. We have goals to produce 30% affordable housing in those areas, but also the transit corridors such as Austin, uh, as Garrett mentioned in Austin, are also important. So I'm not going to go to the case studies themselves, and I'll let the AV guys spool those up real quick. <clears throat> So the last time I was in Arkansas, I spoke with all the housing authorities. Um, I used to be president of the National Association. I has, had about 24,000 members when I was president, 3,500 housing agencies nationwide. And I wanted to pull three examples of projects that I've either been responsible for as a managing general partner or the financier as a public agency because I didn't want to necessarily leave the um, existing infrastructure uh, forgotten. But you have some building blocks here that are worth mentioning. Uh, I was asked as a change agent, and I'm usually brought in as a change agent for agencies. You know, in Portland, it was move the needle on inclusionary zoning. We got that done in one year, i.e., uh, enacted from start to finish in 12 months, and uh, tripled the housing budget. In Vancouver, I was asked to operate a housing authority for Southwest Washington. And the goal was to reduce reliance on federal spending. They were receiving 80, 85 percent of the federal, of their budget was from the federal sources. And this was in 1991. We set a goal to move that down to 33 percent. And that meant we needed to diversify our housing approach and deliver housing without HUD subsidies. So this is a project of 296 units, has absolutely no federal money in it whatsoever. Uh, it was built on a turnkey basis by a private developer and sold to the public agency at a pre-agreed upon price. We sold tax-exempt revenue bonds, um, uh, essential function bonds, whereby 51 percent of the units are affordable to people below 80 percent of the median income. And one thing I always look for are the durable community institutions. We talked a little bit and heard from Sean Donovan about relational uh, versus transactional um, a business. And this particular project includes a um, YMCA, and it's in this particular corner. 296 units from studios to four bedrooms. Everyone has a free family membership in a YMCA with two swimming pools, a climbing wall 40 feet high, all the workout equipment, all the gymnasiums that you would have with a uh, about a $12 million facility. The Paul Allen Foundation donated $8 million to that project to pay for a community athletic facility, partly because they own the Portland Trailblazers and they're in the same media market. So the point was is that we affiliated with a durable community partner in the form of the YMCA. Uh, this was land assembled by a private developer, designed at private expense, and sold on a turnkey basis to the agency. And while it was done in 1999 and 2000, I did an inflation-adjusted calculation last night. It cost $110,000 a unit, all in, in 2017 money, which in that marketplace, it's about $185,000, $190,000 product. So it's significantly below market. And it was uh, the convenience of the developer knowing that they could have their profit and overhead on a date certain if they performed. They were paid on the certificate of occupancy of the project. So this is something that could be done and is worth mentioning because the reason we marshaled this effort was the governor's office was campaigning to get a company called WaferTech, happens to be owned by a holding company called Taiwan Semiconductor, and they were worried about affordable housing in Clark County. So we committed to provide a mix of affordable housing options that would be available in the general community as an economic development recruitment. And it was sold through the governor's office, 
in Taiwan, and they're there today making uh, silicon wafers. Um, it's also within about 300 yards of employment, so it's very centrally located and uh, functions well. The net operating income on this project this, this year is $300,000 over and above all debt service reserve accounts. When I left as Housing Authority Director, it was 450, but they did refinance their office building. All the debt on their office building is covered by the net income from this project, so they're actually reducing their reliance further on federal spending by paying for it through uh, net cash flow. There's another project, go to the, uh, Short Commons, again, um, since you have downtown, it's a downtown plan. This is in a central city location across from a park that was formed about, uh, it, it, before the territory was established. Um, uh, it was a land grant, about 1865. And <clears throat> the blocks there are, um, are 20,000 square foot blocks. So it's immediately across on the west side of a downtown park. And the city was very much committed to having a permanent home for a farmer's market. They had been in the streetscape on weekends for many years. And the city was willing to uh, provide general fund revenue and other support to make uh, a, a permanent home for the indoor farmer's market happen. So this is 160 units, mixed income housing, that was co-developed by the Vancouver Housing Authority as the managing general partner of the project and a special limited partner who took responsibility for uh, one street frontage. If you can see, the, uh, this frontage is 8th Street. There's about seven retail spaces on 8th Street. Private developer essentially delivered $1.7 million of equity to the project and was paid a preferred developer fee all in $2 million. So he got a, basically his money back plus $300,000 after the construction was completed. It was a way to add public value. It's a commercial condominium, so the ground floor has actually got a separate uh, ownership and was sold to seven different businesses. Um, the 160 units themselves include 75% tax credit units, 12% at market, and 13% uh, extremely low income. So this is an instance where people of all incomes are actually living together. Um, the barista lives upstairs, literally and the daughter of the city attorney, the first year we were in operation, was living in the property. So it's got a really interesting mix of folks. Um, so the city was our durable community partner. This was a project that the HUD secretary and the, um, the uh, AIA gave their national design award for the best, best mixed use project in the United States in 2006. And it was designed by a guy named Bill Wilson, William Wilson Architects. And then the last project, would be um, Anthem Park. So Anthem Park, uh, public land was discussed earlier. This was a site owned by Vancouver School District. It was a high school. The high school had been built in 1908, and it was actually acquired by my predecessor at the Housing Authority. When I came to Vancouver, there was still a vacant parcel. This corner was vacant, and in their zeal to do good work, the Housing Authority had leased that corner, about an acre of land, to the Parks Department for community gardens. So there were 20 garden plots on Main Street. This is the north entrance to downtown in, in a town of about 170,000 population. And, uh, but ironically, the people that were using that community garden owned homes in the neighborhood. They just didn't want to rototill their backyard. So uh, while we had an obligation to the residents of a particular high rise, which is nine stories, 152 units on the same block, we didn't have a particular obligation to continue the farmers, uh, to continue the, the uh, community garden. So we went through a long process of negotiated community design. There are actually four neighborhoods that intersect in this area, and um, they wanted very much to see a mix of incomes. And going back to the issue of re relational, not transactional uh, business, uh, they had high rates of school turnover, so they wanted higher incomes. So we ended up on a mixed-use typology, which is very much a messy middle typology, of 27 row houses. These are live-work on Main Street, mostly lawyers. 
Um, and, the, and there's actually an economist there too, uh, Lisa. Uh, and then these are uh, three-story townhouses sold fee simple. Uh, in addition, there is a 57-unit uh, mid-rise, five-story mid-rise here. And that is a tax credit property. Now, the negotiated community settlement involved one half acre of urban open space on the completed project. And it was a one acre site. So there is a landscaped lid on a parking garage in the middle of the property, which unifies the whole thing. It's not gated, it's open to the community, and it's very much a community uh, amenity. It's an urban community amenity. So you will see through each one of these three examples, urban community infrastructure investments as a way to mitigate the density. This is 80 units an acre, but it was a place where people of market rate, home buyers wanted to be. All these units were essentially sold within about a week of the property uh, offering. Uh, it's continuously full, and it's uh, in a transit-rich location with shopping uh, within a few blocks. So we weren't actually depriving anyone of, of food. Indeed, um, you know, there's, there's food within the, within the immediate area, and that farmer's market is actually about 12 blocks away, so it's, it's close enough. Um, so those three examples were meant to be ways by which public agencies could leverage their assets, their ability to issue bonds, their ability to attract uh, public land. And <clears throat> one of my observations was that the housing authorities in Arkansas need some incentives in which to work coll collaboratively and to take some reasonable risks, and those can be mitigated. Um, uh, one of the things that I think would be helpful is ways by which the incentives could be provided for regional solutions using uh, their, their authorities. Uh, I've heard some interesting things about your community development law, which I think needs to be explored a little further as well. And um, in the case of local housing authorities, they can be regional. I mean, in the West, we have housing authorities that cover state lines between Oregon and Washington. They cover county lines. And they can get to scale a little bit easier if they're working regionally than if they're toiling on specific local issues. That doesn't mean that you abandon your local concerns, your local assets, or public assets of the local community. But it also means that you might be able to achieve more by looking at these problems regionally than, than focused just locally. So those are the three examples I wanted to give to you. Um, they're all sort of real. I can give you budgets and backfill gaps that I've had to, to skip over just in the uh, interest of time. And it's a great honor to be here, and I know there will be questions of Ali as well. So thank you very much. Thank you, Kurt. And right now, let's uh, get our last panel up here. Um, We're going to have Sterling Hamilton with Sage Partners Real Estate. Uh, Tim Conklin with the Northwest Arkansas Regional Planning Commission. William Burkhart with Burkhart Construction in the, and on the Bentonville City Council. Um, Kevin Fitzpatrick with the University of Arkansas Community and Family Institute. And I think we have another guest, uh, Lisa Skiles, who's an architect, a developer, and a Fayetteville Planning Commissioner. And do we have all our microphones? One more chair. We need one more chair. Um, so the first thing I want to ask for, I, I think this has been kind of an interesting day of cyclical arguments and, I mean, not arguments, but bringing up these issues that, that come again and again, but faced from a different angle. And so I think it's been fascinating to see, uh, kind of how these topics evolve. But I, um, when I was looking at Allie's slide, you had the, the four points that, that to address the supply, um, you know, increase the supply of affordable rent, and I think this applies to housing as well as rent. Then you had the gap, um, the emergency, and the NIMBY. And I think in our area, what, what we are most facing is the supply and the NIMBY, because as I think Matthew said earlier in the day, um, we cannot build things fast enough. So 
knowing that, knowing that we can't build fa things fast enough, and knowing that NIMBY is kind of an issue in our area, what do you guys have any ideas for how our special region addresses that particular need? So it, uh, it's a great question. I, I would say your region is not unlike millions of other, you know, small communities all across the country. Um, and, and what you do lack that maybe some others do have is sort of capacity. But I think, you know, creative new partnerships, approaches like the one that John, I don't know where he has talked about. I think there's new ideas that can be uh, thought of that will address scale. And it may very well mean some regional partners, you know, again, thinking differently about uh, retro use of new, new uses for existing uh, plots of land. And for sure, just on the policy standpoint, figuring out how you access public land at, you know, cheap prices, and I think there's a lot more detail than specifics we can go into. With respect to sort of building the public will and an understanding, which goes directly in link with NIMBYism, uh, I think for too long in our communities, you know, we use a lot of terms in this industry that mean different things, right? But, um, you know, political power has largely been held in the hands of certain, you know, certain people, and that happens... Uh, and it's sort of been a, a part of a history in, in many of the communities. We are trying to empower and give more everyday working people the ability to get more engaged through our digital platform. And so that's one way to sort of build power, is to help people understand that their voice matters um, and, um, and engage them over time, not just through a one-day kind of session, but in real ways. So I think thinking about digital platform tools, social media, and social connection points, uh, and then coupling those with kind of the existing and traditional ways that you do engagement is something that I would encourage you to do that, to do. And then specifically around NIMBY, um, I think, you know, it's interesting. NIMBYs lose their fight when you can attack their um, often, uh, what did you call it, green, green enveloping of, you know, ideas, which are really about race or class or fear of change, right? And, and so I think the process of engagement and public awareness and changing of perceptions uh, has to come in a lot of different uh, ways, and oftentimes people wait until they've got the housing plan done to start to an engagement process and changing the awareness building, and by then, frankly, it's a little too late. And um, so I would encourage you to have that be a process that you're thinking about early on. Well, one thing I would just add, I, I think I call it eco-apartheid. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, the uh, making as much as possible as right development so that you don't have discretionary approvals, Fight the fight at a policy level. Let the planning commission, the city council duke it out. But once it's approved, every developer shouldn't have to go through a conditional use permit to get an accessory dwelling unit. Uh, Portland, um, and I, I told Garrett I'd certainly mention this, Portland decided to encourage ADUs. So the comp plan calls for 3,000. They're getting about two a day. They're getting more ADUs than they are new single family homes. Of course, it's largely built out, so no wonder. But the ADUs are a way to double the the inventory or triple the inventory. Uh, one uh, practical way to encourage it is, frankly, the city council waives all system development charges for ADUs. And that's worth about $25,000 a unit. There are no affordability stipulations, so many of those go to short-term rentals, but we tax the short-term rentals and we use that money for our housing investment fund, or I did when I was there. And the point is, is that you're creating a more resilient neighborhood which is more diverse, and that if someone wants to age into the ADU and lease out the main home, they can do that. Mm -hmm. And we shouldn't be defining or dictating how they do that. There are some setbacks, there are some design standards, there are no parking requirements, mm -hmm. uh, which of course is controversial, I understand, and Fayetteville's dealing with that. Uh, but I think as much as possible, make the development typology that you want as a right, and structure the incentives to make sure that you're moving the market. I'd also um, go back to one of the early examples from Lisa, I believe it was Chatham Square, this idea that um, some of the housing is indistinguishable from the other to avoid segregation of our communities and um, to create a more diverse and lively community that uh, has authenticity. Um, and then also, where, are, our, where is, are the designers in the process? I think a lot of times we're brought in too late and when you think about um, our creativity in terms of preservation and adaptive reuse, um, the community will be very excited to see that empty, um, vacant parking lot and uh, 
prior big, big box store that's moved further out redeveloped with landscape architecture and architecture. Um, and so often we are brought to the table by the client, by the developer, and we're not sitting at the table at the creative phase. And then it's, we're the necessary evil. But <laughs> the ideas rest with this co creative community. So I guess to the point of engagement um, and to the point, so I, there's two points here, I think, that the barriers um, to more attainable housing, affordable housing, however we want to couch it. Uh, one are structural issues, which I don't think we need to beat into the ground here. I think we all understand there are structural issues, um, especially given all of the small developers that are sitting here and what we've been talking about. Um, I think moving forward that we, it seems as if we have some public will around the structural issues, and I hope, and I hope that changes. Um, I've heard a lot of people um, in my circles who have said, I'm like, you know, I'm really engaged with all the architects and the planners, and we're all going to do this, and they all look at me and go, yeah, right. <laughs> um, and those are, um, for better or for worse, they're a little bit more of the hardcore business people. Um, that is one thing, I think, that when we're talking about engagement, um, we had a ULI meeting that where the mayor of Oklahoma City spoke. And he said, it is better to have unity than to be right. Um, and that's something that I really took to heart. I think it would just sort of, you know, went light bulb like, a, yeah, of course, it's you know, better to have unity than to be right. But one thing that I don't see here is there are several companies that build 95% probably of our housing that we would consider to be affordable. Um, there are a myriad of companies, and I won't name them. And the, part of the, the, the fact that I won't name them, I think, is, a, is kind of a problem. Um, I think that those people, those guys need to be engaged in this discussion. Um, I feel like I do a lot of, uh, in my work, I do a lot of bridging, right? Like I, I talk, um, you know, I have a master's degree in urban planning. I'm married to a wonderful architect. Um, I am completely bought in on the walkability issue. Uh, when it comes to the development side, I think to John Anderson's point, um, it has to make money. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the, I think, the other side of the equation, the people who need to be engaged, um, they need to feel safe in that we do care that their balance sheets aren't going to go in the tank whenever we decide to implement some of the um, either regulations or lack of regulations that we're talking about this meeting. So mm -hmm. the, those are the two. Mm -hmm. I think um, engaging the, uh, the business community and structural issues. Yeah. Um, I, I want to ask one more thing because I, when we talk about the, um, I kind of skipped over the gap and the emergency but we have sitting on our stage somebody who's trying to address that locally, and Kevin Fitzpatrick, if you want to briefly say something about the project you've been working on in South Fayetteville. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I, everything you said uh, squared. Uh, I really appreciate your uh, perspective. Uh, uh, I, I really think that uh, the perspective that, that I bring uh, is is more about a, a different end of uh, attainability. Um, the project that we're in, interested in developing, uh, working with the Community Design Center, is to begin to think about the pathway towards attainable housing for people who live in nothing. Uh, and, and what we're doing is looking at a, a very specific population, a chronic homeless who uh, are in and out of housing, uh, in and out of emergency rooms, in and out of uh, jails, uh, who, who really are not good renters. Uh, they are not good homeowners. Uh, almost have to be uh, retaught uh, what it is to be a, a good renter or a good community member. Uh, and uh, so in Fayetteville, very, very specific lens that we're dropping down. Homelessness, we know, is a regional problem. It's a national problem. Uh, but uh, when, we, when we begin to think about it as a, as a regional problem, uh, everybody shuts down uh, because it's just so big and, and we don't know how to address that. Uh, so, so we're very focused on a, a very local problem, uh, about uh, anywhere between 80 to 120 people uh, on any given uh, day are sleeping in the woods uh, in South Fayetteville and areas around. Uh, that is not because they want to it is because that we have not given them any option. There is no pathway to attainable housing for that 100 or 120 people who live uh, in South Fayetteville. Uh, in, in Fayetteville proper, there are about 30 emergency beds 
uh, for uh, males uh, and, uh, and, and actually females that are non-domestic violence victims in the entire city. Uh, and, and as a result, uh, we are, are interested in, in developing, again, uh, an opportunity that, that lowers the bar uh, for their entry into community and raises the bar for their, their residency. Uh, and we're looking at developing 20 micro shelters uh, that um, uh, sit on roughly a five acre uh, piece of property in, in South Fayetteville. Uh, those micro shelters are supported by a community center that has wraparound services with case management and, and, and so on. Um, we're not interested in just building uh, units for people to live in. We, we need to be able to support them and, and help them find a pathway to the next level. Uh, because again, uh, I think that, that as much as we talk about attainable and affordable housing, uh, we, we have uh, totally forgotten about this population uh, in this region. Uh, and, and again, my, my specific passion is, is for this chronic homeless. Uh, Kevin, we should talk after, because I, I know we don't have a lot of time, but just about housing first models and how you leverage. Yep. I mean, because the good news is there are federal resources, right, that are accessible and they're really easy, good models that you could draw from um, in the not immediate region, but outside. So I'm happy to talk to you about that. Okay. And then I would like to ask Bill, I mean, we, we're, we're blessed with this panel to have some some planning commissioners and, and regional planners. So Bill and, and Tim, I want to make sure you guys have a, a chance to say, say something and address Thank this. You. And I appreciate the event and appreciate the discussion. Uh, I've been doing development and construction for th over 30 years. Uh, I, I wear two hats, also sit on the city council. So I, I've been privileged and, and cursed in a way to understand so many different philosophies coming from different directions, trying to obtain the same thing and they're not necessarily paddling in the same boat. <laughs> so uh, what I hear today about engaging everybody, and I'm, I'm uh, <clears throat> sitting on the council now for almost 10 years, we had the last time we had serious housing discussions were probably 15 years ago. Uh, there's not a resolution on the table to define a mission statement to what is affordable housing and what our mission is uh, as a developer. Uh, I have found over the last 30 years that the same discussions are happening that we had 30 years ago, and the regulations become more extensive, fees become higher, uh, cost of infrastructure and regulations are, are becoming more difficult. So when we're referring to the gap, what I'd like to see, you know, possibly in Bentonville, and both from a developer and a council member, I'd like to see a clear resolution and adoption of what we intend to do about affordable housing. I'd like to see a complete review of our regulations and our specifications and our fee structure, that if we truly resolve to the fact that we want affordable housing, then what can we do not to take the money away <laughs> from all of this federal and partnership and nonprofit giving the money to affordable housing, but yet we're stripping it away at the local level? I once sat in a room and, the, and they said, everybody wants to live here. These, this won't matter because they'll build here anyway. Mm -hmm. I said, yes, but uh, everybody that teaches your kids and all the public safety, the, the screen that you showed, they're having to live outside our town now. And there's a huge gap. And we can't afford to continue building our roads, uh, you know, 50, 80 million dollar bond issues to increase capacity because we're not thinking about how can we reduce the cost not take it from them in the first place to build the affordable housing within at least a reasonable core. And so I hope that these discussions are a leapfrog for, for developers to get involved. I think it's very important that we get more developers involved in business to talk about maybe helping in the conversation. Uh, but we need to get down to what I hope is the focus. Help me, not only as a developer, but as a, as a councilman. I want to fact by fact, dissect what we're doing and define the mission and fix the problem at least uh, without taking other people's money to fix it. Right now I just want to see what we can fix. And so I hope this is a beginning leapfrog into that and I think it's just going to start with uh, stepping up and providing a resolution to make sure that we, we define what we want and uh, whether it's politically hard or not, we just need to get it finished. And I'm, Hopefully we'll do that soon. I would just like to add that 
to do nothing in the major cities in Northwest Arkansas impacts the entire region. Uh, once again, Tim Conklin with Northwest Arkansas Regional Planning, and we do the regional transportation planning uh, for this area. Uh, we're, we already see what's happening outside of Bentonville and Centerton and Pea Ridge and, and Cave Springs and other communities. Um, as we uh, struggle, and we heard uh, today and yesterday about the housing and transportation costs and uh, how much people are spending uh, to provide both of those, uh, uh, it becomes even more challenging as a region as we push out uh, the housing further and further away. Uh, we've had the opportunity and uh, through a grant from the Walton Family Foundation to bring speakers in on how to improve mobility for this growing region. We had Jarrett Walker here back in November and we had Jeff Speck here just last Wednesday. Um, I think what we heard from both of them is that uh, regions and municipalities have limited resources and we can't create a useful transit system that uh, provides the reliability and level of service everywhere in Northwest Arkansas, that it has to be really focused in, in an urban area. And we heard the same thing from uh, Jeff Speck with the term he used, a uh, uh, useful walk. Uh, so to do nothing, we end up pushing uh, the very people that we are trying to provide alternative modes of transportation further out. So something that is, uh, you know, on our minds uh, as a region, and uh, I think these type of events are great. Uh, I would encourage all 32 cities in the region to participate. We now have 20 cities that share city limit line, so it's not just one one city that can address this issue. Okay. One last thing just to point out that I don't necessarily see, and you, you put a light bulb up for me, is uh, large-scale employers uh, in this community need to be a part of this discussion right now. Many of them aren't even aware, probably, of the challenges in terms of affordability. The university, the public health system here, it, and I'm happy to connect you, the Rush Medical Center in Chicago has now, they were dealing with an issue of losing uh, their, their kind of employee base at the high end and at the low end and spent a lot of money with consultants beefing up their benefits. Long and short of it was, at the end of the day, they were still losing population, and it was because at their core, people were having to drive too far, it became, you know, it stressed, and, and they weren't, they hadn't even understood the housing affordability context. They are now having to reshape their benefits and creating a housing assistance benefit program for their employees wow. to keep them there. So I think having them in early, thinking about non-traditional partners, right, that could be part of that solution, uh, and creating new financing vehicles um, that leverage the dollars that you have, right? A lot of people, a lot of great national organizations can help you all think about structured financings that takes private sector philanthropic PRI dollars and spreads them so that you can get to scale more quickly and try some innovative approaches. Fantastic. Just one last thing, talking about the affordability aspect and the cycle time and producing housing. Uh, there are a few things that I've heard over and over that I, I think is easy to do. Uh, the buy right uh, zoning, uh, reducing our cycle time for development processes. It's about a year and a half now to be able to get a product for somebody to move in. In our area, large-scale development process is much too long. Uh, the how we look at zoning when lot sizes, you can't reach the density because of the way we design our zoning. You can't build that lot and get the zoning, even though it allows for a density, you know, five more than what you can actually create. Uh, everything from our fee structure, but reducing the cost through the private sector and then partnering with public. If we could start with that on what we can do, that low-hanging fruit, uh, but there's, it's easy to do. We just have to re-examine it. Okay. Okay. So, do we have a minute for audience? I would, I'd questions? just like to mention yeah. one thing about um, low-hanging fruit. Um, the West Coast mayors get together, San Francisco, L.A., Portland, Seattle, and one thing that happened, they, they declared a state of emergency, and that played out in different communities depending on the local culture. But in Portland, since we've had now for nearly 50 years state land use planning, land use actions taken by a city or a county can be appealed to the Land Use Board of Appeals, which is a state appellant. By declaring a state of emergency, changes could be made to the zoning code to allow some of the things that you're talking about without appeal, which was helpful. 
because we were uh, on a housing first agenda, had actually not increased shelter capacity for 10 years um, by investing heavily into supportive housing, permanent supportive housing, but our population was growing and we needed more shelter capacity. And we had spacing requirements in the zoning code that said shelters had to be so far apart from one another. Well, that was actually waived under the state of emergency. Um, and it made that neighborhoods then had to recognize that they were gonna accept something in their neighborhood. Um, but in this particular instance, they were temporary, so nobody was permanently obligated. Uh, the other thing that I would mention is that I talk about durable community partners. The Department of Veterans Affairs property, and I understand Fayetteville has a med medical center, uh, they have something called the enhanced use lease. You can actually lease property on federal land for 80 years. Uh, and in the instance of the 124 unit project that I did, their sole compensation was that half the residents were veterans. And so they were case managed with public health, mental health, alcohol substance abuse treatment on campus. And uh, a happy byproduct of that relationship is the VA medical centers are actually federal property. They're actually exempt from local zoning. Um, which means that the Planning Commission doesn't get involved. The City Council really doesn't have to get involved. You have to have a plan that is approved. The building permits are approved by a Chief Procurement Officer. And, uh, you know, you can build it without a lot of complications. So look at that kind of relationship because there are par par partners that you have in the community that you might not have thought of. Yeah, that's great. Great advice. As a small firm designer, we've worked with a, a few select developers that are in that incremental uh, development category. And I just, uh, I thought that whole discussion was so much full of opportunity and energizing and speaks to creating a diverse fabric. Um, and I think when we name it, then it has more strength. And um, those relationships build so that developer pulls us in early when they're just looking at the piece of land and we work on a variety of solutions <coughs> so a, a recent solution was achieving their goal of a certain amount of four four units mm -hmm. <laughs> um, while also saving an 1870s historic registry house oh. and so bringing the designer in early with the preservation the sustainability and understanding the development goals, um, you create the opportunity. I also um, serve on the Goshen Planning Commission, and I think finding resources um, and having these discussions with some of the outlying communities who don't have planners on staff, we have a two-acre minimum, which is oh. crazy. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and our, you know, all our rural property uh, becomes objects in the landscape because there is not the expertise in the community to find the solution to um, handle the green space and the city doesn't want to manage the green space, right? Mm -hmm. So opportunities exist on the outlying areas as well. Great. Well, I don't want to cut anybody off, but we do have to let people go at some point. So um, instead of taking audience questions, I think we'll do a kind of an audience participation ending. Mm -hmm. and I'll we are going to do an audience participation you. ending. If I could ask our panelists and presenters to return to the audience. Thank you very much. And thank you, Stephanie. <clears throat> um, you are the, the few, the proud, the possessed of stamina uh, now, and uh, perhaps the, those who are not interested in any sporting events. But um, <laughs> we very much believe in, in uh, our school and what we'll call deliverables, that quite a lot of what our students do is certainly speculation and projections. But at the same time, we have high expectations for our students. And I would like to say we have high expectations in this particular regard uh, today. We haven't entered into these discussions and organized this symposium and walked out uh, towards a competition without a belief that there will be actions that can emerge from these discussions. So that's where we are now. And in a very, perhaps a foreshortened way, uh, because we are at the end of the day, I'd like to think that we could collectively walk out of here having identified three, four, five action items that we can uh, take back into our partnership with the Walton Family Foundation, with our stakeholders who've been represented so ably 
uh, uh, in their uh, participations yesterday and today. And uh, that's what I'm going to try to shepherd us towards. Uh, you remember at the beginning of the morning, I summarized yesterday's presentations with uh, Sean and uh, Darren and others along the lines of leadership, inclusiveness, innovation, and authenticity. Those are general statements. We've had, I think, a great set of specific presentations. What is working uh, across the country? What might be principles or ideas or ways of thinking and working conceptually that would be of value to us here? But again, we need to understand what we can be doing here. So um, I will put this in motion by suggesting two things that I have heard myself and I'll suggest, put these out uh, as propositions that hopefully we can then add to in the next 10 to 15 minutes. And I will say at the other end of all of, of this exercise, there's a glass of wine, a bottle of beer, some refreshments, some uh, snacks and so forth in our uh, exhibition gallery uh, uh, on the ground level. So let's do this last set of fireworks. Here are the two takeaways that I have, and one was just uh, I think, uh, proposed to us, which actually uh, uh, comes before the one that I already had in mind. It would seem, as Kurt has said, that one way of moving things forward is to declare a regional state of emergency in housing. That we need to do this from the leadership level, politically, the leadership level, financially, the leadership level, in the communities, the leadership level, in our universities, in our schools. So I'm going to put that out there. Uh, who de gets to declare that? That's a whole other thing. But let's, uh, I think that might be one initial step to take. And perhaps this gathering itself is a way of beginning to signal a common sense that we are in a state of emergency. Uh, it's not to ring necessarily panic bells, but to say, let's get to work. The second thing, which uh, actually I have uh, took away already from yesterday's discussion that we had before Darren Walker and Sean Donovan's presentation in our discussion with about 30 or so um, community representatives is the need now 15 years on for a regional workshop in housing. This too, we could say, this symposium might be a kickoff for that. But if I take Bill's comment to heart that perhaps we are overdue for that now. But if we can uh, suggest that we're in a state of emergency, one way of beginning to come to terms with that is through a regional workshop on housing uh, that begins to give some, not only facts and figures, but begins to draw in representatives of the larger community to begin to build that inclusiveness that we need, the people power that Esther and others have noted. So I'm putting those propositions out there. Regional state of emergency, regional workshop on housing, and maybe not just one, but probably several in order to get it right and get it really in focus. But I'll take other propositions. This is not my role. Uh, I often say the role of an educator is to ask better questions almost as much as it is to solve problems. So we're posing the questions. Bill. I have been shocked that at being in housing all my life, I've been president of Home Builder Association for so many, I have not met half the groups that are here. I didn't know they existed. And I'm sorry, I just wasn't talking to you. So for, for me that has been so engaged in housing for so long, and being at the, at the government level that I am, not to be aware of all these stakeholders and partners is shocking to me. So if we could bring this down to the local level, I'm in the business, the rest of the council members aren't. I can't imagine what they need to know. So if we could not just do it on the regional basis, but I would like to bring the stakeholders and the nonprofits and the foundations and the, and the ADFA to the local level and have a real discussion on the impediments of housing so we can educate ourselves, get buy-in with the other members of the council, the planning, the staff, and everybody else. What can we do? So I would take it just one step further is have the regional set it up and develop it on the local and bring in all the stakeholders that we've been introduced to today because I think that uh, together we can do it, but 
we don't have the knowledge base individually to even know where to begin. So. Okay. Others. Alex. I think I would encourage you to um, do some early polling, get a sense of what the pulse is of the community. Uh, that will inform some of these regional forums, but I think early polling that you can then sort of continue to revisit is going to be important to understand where the public understands that this issue is. Simply declaring a state of emergency without having the people understand that they've even got a problem uh, is, is, may not be the best way to, do, to go forward. So I just think, think about the various tools that you might be able to use to start to gather some of that er information early on, and then that you can test on a multiple basis uh, throughout sort of the, the process that you're going to go through, the evolution over the next several months, several years, perhaps. Okay. Since you're writing, I'll talk. Uh, one, one thing that occurred to me, uh, you've got some magnificent uh, business and private assets here. And I, I'm working with a, a, a large nonprofit in the Northwest. They, have, they cover all of Western Oregon. And there are about seven to 10 donors that are willing to donate about a million dollars apiece. And it's a social venture fund. And what, what we're looking at is ways in which they can leverage, um, in, increase their output. Um, Pre-development is, is very difficult to attract because it's risk money. It's often not secured. And local government, in our case, will only fund projects that have already tested to be financially feasible. So <clears throat> a social venture fund can do some of the upfront pre-dev work to get to the threshold of feasibility. And um, I would suggest that you link it to regional cooperation, which is to incentivize your local housing authorities and local builders to come together for regional solutions and use that money to draw them to the table. Uh, one other way uh, on the tax credit side is you have to create many reserve accounts, capital reserve, operating reserves. And to do that, you have to borrow more money. It increases your gap. So at the back end, this social venture fund is looking at capitalizing some of those accounts in a pool. And Arkansas Development Finance Authority would recognize that pool as sufficient to cover the debt service coverage requirement of projects. So it wouldn't have to be porn by each project. But it would require a fiscal agent like a United Way or a church-based organization to manage that in common. So that's a place where private parties can leverage public action. And it may be of, of interest to your, your uh, private business interests. Okay. Esther. I think thinking forward in terms of deliverables in the workshop is everyone has a different definition of success. So if you're going to bring all these people together, the deliverables out of the workshop is what defines success for that neighborhood, because all of us have a different vision. And so in a data-driven world, really putting up what our common denominator is, because everyone in here has a very different version of that. And I think also design often hits the back seat when it comes to the production of housing. And when, when you look at simple technologies like the cell phone, it's so innovative, and we're on like iPhone 10 or whatever. Um, but in affordable housing, I'm still developing the Nokia brick. So, you know, I, I try to figure out like for Detroit, what does Detroit modern look like, and what design excellence metrics do we put on the table and say this is the type of design that we want to move the needle forward with in affordable housing? Because in Detroit, I think we're struggling with new construction that is very mediocre, and mediocre is normal. And so, how do you put the design question with the affordability question? So it's not strictly transactional in the number of housing units I'm starting, but how much quality design housing am I putting on the table, and very much for landscape architects too. This is, in Detroit, it's not an architect game anymore. I'm trying to solicit as many landscape architects to come to Detroit because it's a land-based game and a design game. And so instead of letting designers put ourselves on the back seat because it's transactional and quantifiable, all those values you put up there are very social justice-related values, and it requires us to hit it in a very different way through design. So how do we elevate the discussion of design in the production of affordable housing, both from the quantitative and qualitative measures? And that's the new game in housing for metrics, I think. Um, to springboard off a couple of points here, um, there's an effort regionally in the social sector to develop collaboratives on specific um, social service organizations, 
and um, there exists a continuum of care collaborative focused on, on homelessness, but there is not currently a collaborative focused on housing, um, attainable uh, and affordable housing. And um, uh, our organization, uh, Partners for Better Housing, would be, in, would be interested in, in looking at how we can help to convene that conversation and have, uh, have all the nonprofits, housing authorities, um, for-profit developers, um, convening on a regular basis to continue this conversation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I I think the very first thing that needs to happen is is a report, a regional report that daylights this issue. Uh, as someone who had to research this over the past month, uh, there's no agreement on facts. Um, and and in fact, uh, you know, it took a lot of personal interviews just to put the story together. Uh, so everything that we've talked about the last two days has no daylight right now. And the good news is, is that when these kind of reports happen over livability, over infrastructure, over development, over the future, the region does take these kind of reports seriously. I want to chime in and piggyback on that. I want to introduce myself to those of you who don't know me, not as the Associate Dean of the School of Architecture and Design, but as Ethel Goodstein, whose neighbors hate her. Her neighbors hate her because she puts ordinances highlighted in yellow and annotated in their mailboxes. In case you were curious, and I know Marlon is worrying about this, they hate my husband too because he doesn't hesitate to walk over to the yard next door or down the street when he sees the hose spilling water off the lawn that is not sustainably developed and won't absorb it in November. We've got to tell the story that, has, that was implicit in Ali's presentation about Make Room that was explicit in Steve's talking about the knowledge base. What has been on my mind, and is uh, to again echo Peter's point about educators, we spend a lot of time, at least I do, reminding our students the very small percentage of the made environment that is architect and landscape architect and interior designer designed. We, or at least I do, and I know Professor Luoni does, and I know Professor Smith does, spend a lot of time talking about the 99% that is disaffected and talking about the responsibility of sharing the story. There has been video made, there have been notes taken. What's the platform to get the blankety blanks who live next door to me? and the other blankety blank who owns three rental properties in my neighborhood and is in a position to affect change, but won't. How do we tell the story that has been told today to the people who are not in the choir? That would be at the top of my list, Peter, if you can reach up. Let's <laughs> tell the damn story. <laughs> Go ahead, Garland. Well, it probably should. I, I grew up in the comic book land where you can just go to our <laughs> I grew up in Brooklyn. <laughs> Peter. I realize recent events prove that we can say just about anything. <laughs> Peter, the, the, uh, the session, Peter, the session, uh, Yesterday started with the importance of leadership. And um, I've seen it work and it wonders when it was present. Uh, in Oklahoma City, it was three mayors in a row that had the same vision. In Denver, uh, the Denver regional area, it's the Mile High Compact, which um, I want to challenge Tim here. Um, all the mayors talked to each other and they agreed to act jointly under the Mile High, high Compact. So 
we could have a Razorback agreement or something um, that would address transportation, housing, and uh, regional planning, uh, or at least regional dialogue, and it would pull all the regional issues together. Would you, we'd just like to, we have, a, we have a small little bit of that, and when we did the Razorback Greenway, there was a operations and management plan, because all six cities uh, own and maintain and operate the Greenway, so uh, sometimes I share this at Jarrett Walker's thing, sometimes it's like baby steps, you know, we're trying to catch up, but uh, uh, truly, uh, at some point, as a, as a region, to make transit work, to make all these different systems work, uh, we're, we're going to have to be a stronger uh, region and cooperate uh, closely with each other. So I would just add to that, if, if I can, um, that in Steve's right, there's no consistency in the narrative uh, between some of the actors and, and, and potential partners. But one thing that's really missing is an asset map of what we have. So before we get the momentum of the new ahead of a, our curve, you know, like the, the panel earlier that was talking about, wouldn't it be great if we had a two-story school with a park attached to it? And I'm like, uh, yeah, we have one. It's, it's empty. And so we could do that. So that's an asset mapping product. And so where are Section 8 houses, housing right now in the region? Some of our Section 8 housing is pretty craptastic and dangerous, and some of it is really good. And so to have some sort of system where we understand what we have to work with, which is a very, to John Anderson's point earlier, it's a very Ozark kind of archy mentality of like, we can do this and we have what we need, but we need to know what materials we have to work with. I had, just in thinking of this in the overall fabric of society, just in terms of things are changing, addressing in this kind of wages and, and the growing like inequality wealth gap. I mean, we're talking about kind of how do we take the money from the top and funnel it down to kind of like decide where people are gonna live. But I think we have to also talk about, you know, what can we do to make sure that that we address wages, that we address now where people were spread out. There's lots of affordable housing in places where people don't want to live, but now that capital is kind of um, funneling into certain places where, it's a, where everyone wants to live, then how do we also think about when, what, what you're doing with your rent? Like, what is the base problem of that? It's that people don't have enough money to, to pay for it. So I think that that also has to be addressed as a larger social context when we're talking about housing too. Housing is just another line item in someone's budget. Um, and the base problem is that people don't have enough money to pay for it. I'm not quite sure how that is put together, but give me a break. Partner with other um, like kind of anti-poverty or you know social justice organizations, because this isn't a problem that's occurring in a silo, it's occurring in conjunction with all of these other things. So instead of just, yeah, thinking about architects and developers, then, you know, how does that then relate to overall movements, um, like in Seattle, like where we came from, just like the raising the minimum, minimum wage, like as a response to um, what was happening with housing costs there and how that all relates. We can do all this stuff, but if the people are still getting paid like $7 an hour, this is never, nothing's ever gonna happen. We're just gonna have to keep subsidizing and we're gonna be stuck in this. this afternoon. 
I uh, appreciate the fireworks that we can still produce at the very end of not only today, but also yesterday. And, and I appreciate very much the energy that people have transferred from yesterday to today. On behalf of not only the Faye Jones School, but also our, our partners, the Walton Family Foundation, I want to express my appreciation to a succession of, of people, uh, our presenters, our panelists, our moderators, our students who've uh, hung in there, faculty who've participated. Uh, I want to especially recognize now at the end of the day our staff of the school who have worked not only here today in the school but actually did everything at record yesterday to organize that facility so well. Um, we have a superb staff uh, who uh, have, uh, of course, worked overtime in many ways to bring this forward uh, for us in such a hopefully well-ordered and comfortable way for you all. Um, I need to name just a, a couple uh, people who have worked first and foremost in this regard. Uh, Lane Schmidt, assistant to the deans, Elizabeth Tetley, who's our program, special events and public programs manager. And you've met uh, already Stephanie Foster in a number of ways, but uh, she very much has been the, the prime mover so much for so much of this uh, grant activity. Could I have a round of applause of appreciation for all of that? Um, a couple things now going forward before we uh, go to the, the, the refreshments. Um, please continue to follow what we're doing here with the Housing Northwest Arkansas Initiative. Again, on social media, it's going to be up and running. The website, housingnwa.org, will be up and running through the semester. And there you can follow the progress of our studio uh, as work is uploaded onto that. And beginning March 1st, you can begin to follow the progress of the uh, invited competition that we are preparing to launch. Um, obviously, we have uh, work to do, uh, and I very much intend to take this forward into further deliberations and move this, move this agenda forward. Uh, but for now, perhaps there's just reward, at least in a bottle of beer, glass of wine, other refreshments. Um, we're going to, however you choose to go, you can go overland by going uh, second floor down to ground floor, or you can actually go out through our lower level here, come back into the building. We'll be um, having our reception in the Smith Gallery on our ground floor. There you will find on the walls a superb exhibition by our faculty member, Laura Terry, uh, work that uh, documents her progress across the 35th parallel of the United States, landscapes in uh, drawings and prints and paintings. Uh, but uh, there you can enjoy refreshment, a little bit more fellowship. Thank you, thank you, thank you one and all for being with us in Housing Northwest Arkansas Initiative. Thank you.